So it is very appropriate that we're opening up the MedTech conference with you, Todd Yusin. Thanks for joining us and being the bravest first in. <laughs> no, it's great, Joe. It's always a pleasure to sit down with you and the Mullings Group and uh, welcome to Boston. Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, I, 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 I've always appreciated the work that you do. I mean, oh, you know, I, I met you and knew, know you um, from you recruited me to this company. But um, I've worked with executive recruiters and that I'm tremendous relationships, tremendous respect. Um, you guys are a med tech company. You're, you're a med tech firm in a sense, and you, you know med tech. You're at these types of conferences, not, not, not recruiting, but understanding and learning, sitting on leading panels, sitting in discussions, interviewing leaders. You're, you're really um, advertising and enabling all of us to build this market. You're, you're basically the conduit to the future for med tech, and I appreciate the work that you've done, Joe, in helping us scale, because what I'm most comfortable with in, I'm doing it uh, conservatively, but scaling the company. I've now been able to bring on a, a few key executives in skill sets that I don't have to make sure that we're focused on the right things. Um, I have now a head of uh, quality and operations and supply chain. It's all mixed into one because that's the way you need to do it now. But these are things that we need to do as we're finishing up our, our, our design phase. And we'll have a design freeze at the end of November. And we're scaling up. We have uh, spots for more engineering. We have spots for marketing. We have, we're, we're going to then start branching out and building some of that selling organization and just brought on a commercial leader. Uh, I'm honored, uh, brought on some really talented people. And you know what, sometimes you have to pay for them. And I'm going to do that, but I'm, you, you, you want to win. That's pay what you now do. or you pay later. I absolutely agree. So go get one person instead of two people that you, you pay a little more money that can do the job of three people and then you win. And um, I, I, I'm lucky enough to bring in a few superstars. We're going to scale this out. We'll double our size of our organization uh, within the next uh, six months. And um, you know, the Mullings Group will be helping with that. But um, I, I really do appreciate it. And this is the part that I'm really enjoying the most. We're building this company and we're going to be in good shape. So bring us up to speed. You know, we've been following the journey with Active Surgical. And for those that don't know, um, Todd is the CEO of Active Surgical with a very unique technology. I'll allow you to share that with the, the audience. But where are we right now with Active? So we're in a good place right now. Active Surgical, as you know, that foundational technology was Dr. Peter Kim had done autonomous robotic uh, soft tissue suturing. Um, which is wonderful, and, but it's really that special sauce that's underneath the hood of autonomy that allows us to take that technology with sensors and cameras and AI and machine vision, mm -hmm. machine learning, computer vision, and bring it to the mainstream surgical technologies and imaging systems to put that information in, into the scopes and into the hands of uh, doctors and into robots so doctors can get data and information that they cannot get any other way they can bring CT scans to life intraoperatively. They can see blood flow and data that they, that they need without any dyes intraoperatively. They can see critical structures without any dyes intraoperatively, real time. Turn it on, turn it off, turn it on, turn it off. And we believe that every single system that's out there is going to be a partner, not an enemy. They're going to be friends and we're going to make sure that we give them the systems to help enable their systems to then enable physicians to get more data and more information to make consequential decisions every day. Active is in a great place right now. We've uh, completed our A round uh, with tremendous support from our investors. How did you find the environment, the fundraising environment? Um, I hear people complaining. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I like every big meeting, every big discussion. I mean, I, I sat down with some people when I started. As you know, I came from big companies and I was uh, The other side with, of the table. Exactly. We were president looking at, and CEO, you're being humble, president of Olympus America and also Smith Nephew, right? Yeah, yeah. so um, those two presidencies were basically the batting cage to get ready for this. <laughs> um, so you can have two to three to 4,000 people, but to the 17 to 20 people that I have now, I'll tell you what, it's, um, you wake up every day knowing that, man, this is, a, this is a great purpose. And I loved every second that I was at Boston Scientific, Smith and Nephew and Olympus, and I love every second that I'm here. But I found the, the environment, people ask me that. So you came from these big companies where you were buying companies. So how, are you ready to go talk to VCs? I said, well, I, I can do three things. Um, I, I can sell the value proposition. I can sell the team that we're about to build. And the part I like the least, but I'm okay with now because I was told to do it, and I can sell myself and my background. And if they need anything more than that, I, they'll ask me what they need and I'll try to get them the answers. But I feel confident in doing that. And the conversations have been wonderful. And, and the technology and the team are, are st speaking for themselves. I found the environment great. We did it very quickly. I started in January. 
by the end of March, we had a, our strategic vision of what we needed to do. We always knew that autonomous play is out there, but there's so much more opportunity to build what we have here at Active that I needed to make sure that we're setting up the story appropriately and making people realize that there's a much greater market than waiting to 2024 to get into robots and to be autonomous. I can be in scopes in 2020, share this visual, get these data sets that I need for AI and machine learning to get ready to program robots. We'll have hundreds of thousands of patients by the time we get to 2023. And you fit on most of the stacks, on a storage stack, on an Olympus stack, Striker stack, right? Just plug and play. Yeah, it's just a, it's just a plug and play technology. And then um, we will be partnering with the robotic companies as we've had great conversations with uh, many of them, if not most of them, and um, about how we would build together to get onto the, the robotic platforms. But these are just, that's general surgery. That's uh, the OR, that's uh, the Stryker Storts and Olympus. Then you have the orthopedic opportunities. Then you have the cardiology opportunities, the neuro opportunities, the needle scope opportunities. There's so many opportunities we have to pace ourselves. To me, everybody's a carrier. And how do I take that carrier? Because we, we just want to make sure that our visual data and our images can get onto their systems to help their doctors. And that's really the goal. I'm not looking for active to be the famous one. We're going we're gonna to activate every one of those systems. The way I would say it, Joe, is, um, so I say autonomous robotics is how we started. And that's been done. Dr. Kim drove the autonomous car. But with autonomous cars, not everyone's ready for the Tesla and the autonomous car. But let's, let me take you on a little journey how we would have a parallel path to the cars uh, when I look at what we're doing at Active. So for the last 10 or 15 years, we've had an, uh, a reverse camera in your car. When you go in reverse, the camera comes on. If you're about to crash into a wall, you're going to get a loud beep. That's just data given to the driver that the driver can make better decisions. That's one. More recently, you have rear view mirror that might have a little orange triangle on it in certain cars when you have a car in your blind spot. In the past, you'd turn around or look over one of your shoulders. But that's now providing you data that you didn't have before to give to the driver to make decisions. Your car swerves lanes on the middle of the highway. The seat vibrates or the steering wheel vibrates. That's just data. Even take it back to empty and full on a gas tank. It used to just turn, the light would go on. You'd be freaking out. I did when I was 17 years old. I said, oh no, I'm out of gas. Now, it says I have 35 miles left. I'll get it in the morning. You know, I can get it because it's just data. And that's all we're doing. So even those people that aren't ready to drive an autonomous car, they're all collecting data in their existing cars today to get them ready for that. Just like I want to give every surgeon in the world additional data that they don't have today in their traditional procedures. So when they go to robotics, if they go to robotics or when they go to robotics, or for those doctors that are in robotics, I'm going to give them the surgeon supervised, the surgeon in the loop opportunity, and that's what we're doing. And that's what we've shared with our investors. And I, I think the story has been wonderful and the investment community, we raised our A round in, in less than two months and it was really nice. And you had some interesting players in there too. So you had the non-traditional investors. You, one of them was uh, GPV, right? Mm -hmm. Great Point Ventures, and that yep. was... Yep. Great Point Ventures right. was uh, originally the uh, three gentlemen, um, Ray, Andrew, and Ashok, but Ray Lane was the uh, original COO and president of Oracle. A tech company. Yeah, a tech, big tech company. Right. And uh, they've made some pretty big investments. We've had uh, Tau Investors, Tau Capital, um, one of the leading investors in Tesla, mm -hmm. as well as an investor in Juul. Um, they're, they're very focused on tech. We've had DNS Capital, as DNS is our lead investor, and uh, DNS has been uh, one of the leading investors in Beyond Meats. And so, so non-traditional, but um, new wave in investors that have looked at our uh, technology and looked at the things that we're doing. And uh, we, we've, been, we've been very lucky in that sense. But because of that, those original three were some of our original seed money. So we came out to raise money, and we were originally focused on autonomy, and then we sat down and they hired a med tech exec. They said that was their one goal because they wanted to see if this is a scalable opportunity sooner. And then we presented the opportunity to be in all surgical procedures by 2020, with the to start in 2020. Uh, that opened up the gates and that, and that original group said, we're ready to lead the A round. And that wasn't what I was expecting. So they, they freed me up in a sense from having to run around to everybody else. I have spoken to med tech investors and we just signed um, one of the largest imaging companies in the world both consumer and medical, that I, uh, I'll be making the announcement very soon is part of our A round, money's in the bank, but it has to be done the right way. 
And uh, we're extremely excited because that also validates the technology, that it's medical, and that it also plays along across all walks because it's a real visual and imaging data play. And um, so we're in a really good place right now. I remember when we first started building Active and uh, was working with Jonathan out of GPV, and that entire team, Ray included, weren't convinced it was ex wasn't weren't convinced it was exclusively a medtech play. In fact, they said the acquirers could be Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, and then when they focused and brought you in, and then you added that validity to the tech coming from the players you were in. What what did you see as a CEO who made the jump from big companies, billion dollar companies, and I remember the phone call, but what did you see that said, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and empty the dishwasher at this company? Yeah. And um, yeah, I, what did you see? What, what would be the guidance you would give to these career CEOs and presidents who have been in the big company and you've made that leap? Well, you know what? There's always plenty that you don't know, and I'm the first to admit there's tons I don't know, and news flashes, plenty I won't know ever, you know, and I'm okay with that. But sometimes I feel like I have the answers to the test. And, and what I mean by that is I know sitting across from small companies and going into diligence that. The first thing everybody thinks of is, yeah, we know that you have good technology. That's why we're sitting across the table from you in the first place. So if I'm just a founder engineer right off the bat, thinking that it's all about my design, it's all about this product, this product, this product, but I'm not thinking about building the company out or scaling the right departments, I know that quality, the quality management system, the compliance system were critical that things that a big company is going to look at any small company right off the bat to make sure that we're focusing on that. I know that supply chain and operations, design for manufacturing is as important as design for this great technology. We have to make sure it's buildable, it's scalable. And then also, you know, I, I, it's amazing to me how I realized how much people don't realize what a commercial team is, what marketing is, you know. Because we say I have this great new invention, it's going to cure cancer. Well, why don't we go validate that first? Let's go test the market and who's ready to buy it, who's going to bring it in. Do we know anything about value analysis committees? Do we know anything about uh, the way to get a product into hospital? Healthcare and economic reimbursement and outcome planning. Value-based medicine, it's not, it can't just be a bumper sticker. It has to mean something. So part of me feels that I, because I'm able to focus on those things and rely on the great skills of our engineer and our tech teams, that I'm able to scale this company at a quicker pace and really focus on the things that I need to. And um, so sometimes I do feel like I have the answers to the test. And, and that's an important message to the VCs because you know, I've been at building the company side for 30 years and the startups especially. And oftentimes the VCs knee jerk reaction is, oh he or she is a big company guy or gal. You know, they've never really done the startup thing. They've never really had to work from a, a position of lack of resources. You know, she was used to having a secretary. Yeah. And is that a fair or unfair statement across the board. Yeah, I, I think it's fair, but I mean, nobody came in. That, I didn't start my job at in my medical career as the president of all medical divisions at Olympus. I started as, a, as, a, as an associate sales rep at a college that had to basically cut my teeth and figure out how to go stand in an operating room next to a surgeon. So I, I didn't take anything for granted. I didn't have a big expense budget that I was running around with making this. It was all about me. I've always been, if not me, then who? So you, this is perfect for me. So if you want to go put your money where your mouth is and go make something happen, go do it. But it's still about people. And just one of the things you said, what would you share with a startup CEO, another one? Don't just think you have to do it with the two people, you and your best friend that were two founders. You still have to have great talent or use consultants or use other people that know things that you don't. Because the one thing I've never, I've never pretended I know more than most people because I know what I know, but I also know what I don't know. And if you rely on other people, I will bring in experts at any specific area that I know I need, whether it's operations or supply chain, whether it's development, whether it's legal, whether it's finance. I know enough to be dangerous as a startup in those, but I want someone at the table telling me, Todd, this is what we have to do if we're going to be great. I understand too that just because I know what the big company is, it's okay that I, I can make my own hotel reservations. You know, it's not that complicated now. If it was a five years ago, I'm not sure I want to call a travel agency, maybe 10 years ago. But to be honest with you, it's fine. It's not, anyone that's worth their weight and salt, if they're not ready to roll up the sleeves, and I'd be a bad hire if I was that 
person from the, from the board. The board hired me. They wanted a med tech exec, but they wanted someone that understands the business, that's ready to go build a team, that's been part of a team. Yeah, and I think it's also, as they mistake it and think, adversity can't be faced with a big company executive, right? So whenever you're looking for somebody in a startup is, how is she going to handle the adversity in this role? And, and, and you bring up a great point. You cut your teeth and you overperformed at every station overcoming adversity. Yeah. And so you don't become that CEO, nor do you have a memory loss when you're there. Right. And, and nobody in med tech or any company starts off as the CEO unless it's their parents' company, right? And they just, they, they replace them. In a big company, you gotta, you gotta work your way up. You have to get trained. You have to, plenty of lumps and you, you count on great mentors over the year to help develop you and things that you count on. I, I think you do cut your teeth, Joe. You have to really learn it, but it, it's, it's also, there's a hunger. I mean, this is legacy building. Not Todd Eusen's legacy, but the legacy of this technology. We can go out and do something. You know, my wife actually, she said to me when I, when I was taking the role, said, are, are, are you just checking a box? Because you've done everything but raised money? I said, no. Um, I really am not checking a box. I just really believe, because I'm seeing something even in the interview process, this company has great technology, unbelievable technology. I'm not even sure they're seeing what I see from a commercial side. What I don't know from the technical side is if everything that's in my head is possible, but the second they tell me that it is, be careful, because I'm going to go sell it. So uh, uh, we have a great team. Tom Califf is an amazing CTO. Michael Ruhlman's a wonderful GM. These are two foundational pieces of any business. You want partners like this that you can count on. Peter Kim is a tremendous, humble, world-renowned pediatric surgeon. When you have a surgeon as a founder that wants nothing to do with being the CEO or running the business, but he wants to be in every clinical case and make sure you're guiding and make sure that you're there for discussion on a daily basis, you can't really go wrong. You mentioned something earlier about the getting the data to the, the either the surgeon or the team. Yeah. And so I think our friend Harel Gadot had put it, and maybe he lifted it from somebody else. But it's robotics right now, or at least you know certain parts of that, is um, an assist mentality. You know, master slave. Now we're in the advisement side. Here's the data. You make the final call, but I'm going to give you so much data and give you advice that you might not see or yeah. be aware of but you're still going to pull the trigger. Yep. And then we're going to graduate eventually to autonomous, somewhere or another. Take me through the next 12, 24, 36 months with that runway with Active. Sure. So basically the first thing to do is you want to get as much data as you can. There's two ways to get data if you were just going straight robotics. One is work with uh, research institutions, get as much data as you can, follow up on old patient data as much as you can, or go live. And um, by being able to take a technology and put it onto today's uh, stacks and towers, and vi video, imaging, go to orthopedics, go to vascular, go, we have handheld technology for, for flaps and other procedures that are out there um, to collect the data on live patients while you're treating them and doing something that's really beneficial with simple perfusion and vascularity, blood flow data for physicians. But then I have all of that patient data, so over the next three years we'll have 100,000 patients minimum of data for our data set for number one. Then we start getting into 3D digital mapping and, and real-time measurement and being able to pre-register your pre-op image whether it's an MRI or CT and bring it to life in 3D moving it around while never moving the camera intraoperatively. Um, that's, that's additional data and huge understanding when we start looking at tissue tumor margins, sentinel nodes, the identification of those, which we've already shown and demonstrated. I'm not, I'm not claiming victory yet, because that's not where we're starting, but that's part of the path. And then we sit down with all the robotic companies that are working with us today, or communicating with us, and we sit down with their operating systems. We don't have to set them up for uh, total autonomy just yet, but they each use a visualization system. And as we've talked about before, today, these systems are amazing. I mean. CMR just raised 240 US dollars, 195 um, European. I mean, it, it's, it's amazing what the market is asking for. Intuitive has, has set the tone for the entire world. Oris. Yeah, yeah what Oris has done and Transenteric's been public. I mean, there's companies that are out there that have done their, uh, that have done their work and they want to go into the future in, and far into the future. But today, whatever the image, whatever the scope sees, the doctor sees. Whatever the doctor sees, the scope sees. And then, 
depending on which robot is better than the others, it's whichever system is better, they can then go manipulate the arms and move them in, in, in ergonomic and fantastic ways that you can get to places that you can't see, whether they use their eyes, whether they use their arms, whatever. And they all have fantastic technology. What if you could see something that the surgeon can't see? What if we can give that doctor more data? These robots are amazing, but every, it's all focused on the surgical device and the hardware side. This software capability and the imaging and what I can pre present to the doctor. So if I could go to an intuitive or a CMR or a Medro or a Colubris or any of these, these robotic companies and give those doctors more data and then they can use the magic of the robot from that point. I'm going to let them see things they can't. I'm going to bring the CT scan to life now go do your surgery with these magic of robots, that's where we're going. That's all within the next four years. Soup to nuts. So, when are you looking at your B round? B round, I'd like to say, will be uh, closing in, in June. Mm -hmm. So, as I realized too, always raising money, and you close your A round, and I'm, I'm, I'm very thankful. But now that we've had the opportunity to speak to some more med tech investors, in addition to other Silicon Valley investors, versus that original seed round group, and if, I'd welcome them any day. They are the most supportive and the best group of people. The people that invested in us before I was here, that have come back to invest in us again, have been wonderful partners. They're not all, none of them are looking for me to make a quick exit. They're looking for me to run a company. They, they hired me to operationalize this. Um, and they'll be there and supporting the company no matter where we go. Now we get ready for our B round. We, we're spending time in, uh, all over the world because this isn't a US product. This is a global product, so working with global investors uh, in the UAE and in Europe, uh, in Asia, um, and we've had wonderful sit-downs and wonderful meetings, and that's our vision. So um, I feel really strong about where we're going to go. Awesome. Where are we in regards to the FDA? Let's let's make sure we touch on that. Where are we on approval? Meeting with the FDA. Sure. What's it look like? Sure. So um, key milestones that we've had: we've, we we had our pre-submission meeting in July with the FDA. Went through everything from our gen and our whole Gen 1 product line, and um, from everything from our technology to our software to where we're standing. Joe, I wish I could tell you we had a few yellow flags. No red flags, not even yellow. They, they're really appreciative of what we're doing. We showed them the work, and like I said, maybe having a surgeon as your partner, we've done a lot of clinical work already, um, doesn't hurt. So we're on target for our design freeze at the end of November. Um, we have our submission to the FDA on Gen 1 in March which we're building towards and we're very excited about. Uh, I have first in man planned in Latin America at the early winter. Prior to that, working with partners uh, across the world in that because I think that's critical and anytime that you get that opportunity. Um, Want to make sure that we're doing some uh, studies to make sure, not necessarily the clinical studies, the acquisition studies, the value analysis studies. Do I have 100 hospitals out there that are ready to buy the product? And I'm going to share that with all of our investors because so far this is what they're saying. So people feel confident in this technology early and the reasons why. Um, and then um, if, if it's a class two, no human clinical needed on Gen 1, which means that we could be anywhere from three months to six months post FDA submission in March. So as soon as June or as late as September, and then we'll go into our limited market release. We have select hospitals that have already been uh, targeted across the country that we're working with the key uh, physicians and surgeons, as well as administrators, as well as payers, as well as reimbursement teams, as well as value analysis to make sure that we're commercializing this thing the right way. And uh, it's not just a clinical play, it's a business and a partnering play. Yeah. And uh, so we're right now I feel really good about where we are between now and next September. Yeah, you're set up. and. Um... I'm excited because this is really that leading edge of this whole robotic, image guided, see what you can't see technology. And I'm not sure there's a better company sitting in a sweeter spot right now in the industry. So uh, uh, you're not going to need any luck, it's just going to be execution. No, and Joe, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's not that, hey, you know, that what maybe Silicon Valley always loved to hear, I got this moonshot play, this, we're building this robot that's this big and it's going to do, you know, surgery with the from your you know two countries away or wherever you are but if you want to be in all surgical procedures if you want to be in every robotic procedure or have a chance to be then active is the way to do it or no matter what robot is out there they're all going to be competing against each other there's going to be tremendous consolidation in the space but we have, we're setting up a technology to partner with all of those companies to make sure that we are a player in all of those and one of the key roboticists around the world, um, I'd venture to say he might have done the most robotic surgeries anywhere in the world, said to me, Todd, this technology will help bring more people from regular surgery into robotics because you're providing this visual data 
imaging that they can't get so they'll feel more comfortable and realize it's now worth using robots because all that money that I'm going to spend on a robot, and I don't mean it that they're too expensive, will be justified because now I'm going after things that today I can't see. And when I can see those and then I have the chance at autonomy, you're going to help this entire space and that's all, that's music to my ears. That's a great position to be in. Well, thanks for sharing the active story and bringing us up to date on yeah, it. Yeah, I know. Thank you, Joe. Thanks. It's always a pleasure. Thanks, I appreciate it. it. Thanks.